We're talking about infrastructure provision, and I'd like to invite Scott Lennon, who's a partner at PwC, uh, to the stage. Where's Scott? There he is. He's coming along. Um, and this is, this is down to a very um, specific and, and really critical issue about the new planning system, the, the idea of aligning the funding and delivery of infrastructure with strategic planning to support growth. Um, how do you assess infrastructure needs? Who pays for them? How do you decide? Thanks, Scott, if you have a seat. Um, so uh, Scott is a partner at PwC. He has extensive experience in infrastructure and economic analysis and policy development. Um, he's going to talk to us uh, for five minutes just about the policy thinking around this area uh, of infrastructure, uh, who pays and how do you decide. And then we're going to come to uh, two very specific questions about who pays for infrastructure and present you with some options. And once again within that process, after the end of each question, we will open up these screens and allow you to put another option or to make a comment about what you think uh, were perhaps the limitations or anything else uh, about the question that was asked. Uh, so Scott, if you'd take it away and just uh, start talking to us about uh, the issue of infrastructure and how do you decide who pays. Thanks, Helen. Um, I think the discussion this morning has uh, underscored we're all in violent agreement we need the infrastructure and ideally we need the infrastructure in advance of the people arriving in the housing estates uh, so that these communities are connected and more livable. But infrastructure is expensive and the challenge we're going to face in these next couple of questions is how do we pay for it? Infrastructure is getting more and more expensive, actually, particularly as we cope with rising environmental standards. I think the Green Paper sort of foreshadows a, a couple of changes in how infrastructure will be funded. I think most of the options canvassed in the paper talk about spending it in a more targeted fashion on a more tightly defined set of uses. It also talks about spending it more prudently and getting better value for money from the spend via contestability. And it also seeks to avoid sort of any of the parties hoarding the cash or, or keeping it for too long and depriving the communities of the infrastructure we want. Infrastructure has a very broad meaning. There's sort of the, all the social infrastructure, there's the roads, the utilities and the transport infrastructure, but it's all vital to ensure our communities are much more livable. I guess we turn now to how we're going to fund it, and there's really sort of four general sources for how we fund it, and each of the sources has a series of challenges. The New South Wales government at the moment has a fairly tightly constrained budget. It's got a stated policy commitment of keeping a, a AAA rating, and it's had a series of adverse budget movements against it, particularly on the GST. The local government sector also has some fairly tight budget constraints. It's uh, dealing with rate capping and some of the councils in the growth areas have uh, very high capital expenditure requirements. The other source of funding for these type of items is developers taking a share of the profit that they would earn from developing these estates. We have to be careful though on that particular source. Uh, Sydney, New South Wales has had relatively higher levies uh, and developer contributions compared to other states. And other, the, the main property developers have been far more active in Melbourne and also Brisbane than they have been in Sydney. So we have to have a sharp eye to how competitive the contributions or the levies are in Sydney so that those developers come back and, and fully play in the Sydney market in particular to overcome the shortfall in housing. I guess the, the final source of funding for the infrastructure is probably the home buyer. But again, we've got a problem there because Sydney housing is already at the less affordable end of the spectrum and we've got some shortages in some localities. So the ability to pass a lot more of the levy through to the final home buyer is also fairly constrained. So in designing the new contribution system to fund infrastructure, we've got to strike a very fine balance between a fair mix of those four sources. Uh, so it's quite a, a task in front of us. We also have to consider what the right blend is from existing houses across Sydney and whether they should make a contribution that 
cross subsidizes apologies for the jargon uh, to the new areas of housing so what the what the right mix is between uh, in increasing the price of the new housing compared to uh, making a contribution from existing householders. So we might turn to the questions with those as introductory remarks. The, the first question that we're asking for your input to is, in considering who pays for the infrastructure, which of these five options do you most support? Um, Uh, agree this concept will apply equally to the regions? That's not right. <laughs> there are a whole host of different issues in the region. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the five options uh, are up on your screen and I'll, I'll talk you very briefly, uh, yeah, five on the screen. I'll talk you briefly through what we mean by each of them. There's the current system, uh, arguably fairly complex uh, and probably in need of some modernisation. Uh, you, you're all generally familiar with it, but it has a mix of Section 94 or 94A, local government uh, imposed levies, as well as some special infrastructure contributions uh, levied by the, the state government. And there's also a, a voluntary planning agreement uh, option as well for the larger developments. I guess the green paper on VPAs or voluntary planning agreements um, uh, has a very open mind. I think the question's framed, we could do more of them or we could give up VPAs altogether. So it's uh, quite a, uh, an area where the government's after feedback. Uh, but VPAs could exist in each of the five options there or again, they may not be continued. So the, the first one is the current system. The second one is a use of local and regional levies, whereby the developers would pay a levy or, or the ratepayers would pay. And again, in option two, what we're trying to achieve is a stronger nexus between the beneficiaries of the infrastructure and those that make a financial contribution. One of the, the, uh, the theories behind that is that if there's a, a site-specific beneficiary uh, in that the uh, benefits received from that particular infrastructure are very close to the development or the housing in question, then it is probable the developer would be the key beneficiary. If there's a broader local benefit across a, a council area, then perhaps the, the local government is the best party to uh, put a levy on that type of infrastructure or indeed the ratepayers as a whole might make a small increase to their annual rates to cover that cost. Or thirdly, there could be a regional benefit. Uh, in planning infrastructure on a much more integrated fashion, many of the assets that go into these areas will be regionally provided. And in that case, a regional levy of some description would apply to regional level infrastructure. So that's a, a new model option two. Uh, it's one I think the Minister and the Director General have seen active in several overseas jurisdictions. Uh, I think it, it applies fairly well in Canada at the moment and is um, making a, a good difference to improving planning system. The third option is what was canvassed in the green paper. Uh, it's a um, extension on the second, uh, but with a variation whereby there'd be a regional open space levy that would apply to all new development. There'd be local infrastructure plans, which would be largely developer funded. Then there'd be growth infrastructure plans, which would largely be funded by the state government. Finally, the, the fourth option, much more simpler, hopefully simpler. Uh, it would be more of a, a vanilla percentage uh, of the capital cost or the construction cost of a certain development, and that would apply over a certain threshold so it doesn't capture the, the smaller renovations but captures the, the larger developments. And finally, fifth, uh, an option we're calling a growth area bond. And this one was proposed in a couple of the submissions to the Green Paper. Uh, involved in this option is a combination of capturing the increased stamp duties and land taxes that come from putting in infrastructure, as well as probably some sort of special area rate that would apply 
uh, in the particular growth area. Uh, those more familiar with this particular um, instrument might also know it as tax increment financing. It's been very um, widely used in the United States uh, in particular. Uh, so it, it's a, a new way, a new approach, and interested in the group's feedback on that. Any questions on the five options before we sort of turn to voting? All of those are proposed to be levied on a one-off upfront basis or whether they are intended to be um, levied over a series of years? Yeah, good question. I think the Green Paper recognised um, that levies do have uh, a consequence of putting a cash flow pain on some of the, the development companies or the construction companies and the government wants to be more conscious of that to try to get the, the timing right uh, so that development's not deterred. Uh, so I think there's some open-mindedness in terms of the exact timing of it. Um, I guess at one end of the spectrum there is the upfront model uh, or there could be a series of payments made over years as the product comes to market to minimise that cash flow pinch point. Uh, all, all those options, I think, are, are under consideration. I'm from regional New South Wales at the moment, Newcastle. There's no development really going on on a middle level um, developer because they can't get the money to do it because of the GFC and also they're on such a tight budget to do the development. It's not like Sydney, you know, you have significant large amounts of uh, money coming in with big development situations. But in these regional centres, there's small time, small men, local. The levy gone cost to that sort of construction. That's why it's so halted. I don't know how that would go, or how you would even kick start it. So this is a real problem. And then also at the local level with the councils trying to cope with their difficulties with their own budget. They're such a mess, some of them. And that's all across New South Wales. You can pick on one council if you live there, but it's general. So how do you manage that? And then the regional level, council says, oh, you know, state's taking our monies from our local development, who then are the small time developments in these country areas. So that's quite a complex thing that we're looking at here. That who's got the biggest cash flow wins, those who have got the least battle along and if you can't battle along, you just sell your block. Now, that's happening across Newcastle. Uh, prime land right on the harbour, really good site with a view corridor. Those people couldn't get their money, small developer. They've actually put their block up for sale. Okay. So that's what happens then? So that's a full gamut of those, some of those things you're talking about in reality. No, thanks, I, thanks very much for I'd that. I'd agree. It's consistent with my opening comments that it's a very delicate balance we have to find in the right mix of all the possible sources of funds. I think there's a question... Look, look there are a couple more questions or comments. We'll keep them very brief because we're conscious that we promised to get folks out of the room in the next 15 minutes, so we'll be brief. Hi, um, Jane Nguyen from the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects. Um, it's part comment, part question. The language of both of the speakers has been um, around the development of... Housing estates, are we to assume that these only apply to greenfield housing estates on city fringes? Um, or, or are you talking about all development? And if, if you are, then can we actually have some language that's, that applies as well? Um, and, uh, sorry, and I guess the comment with that is, is that um, we should be planning infrastructure and development together, not just thinking about how we pay for the infrastructure when we've looked at where the growth areas are. Yes, I'd, I'd agree. I think the principles could equally apply to industrial, commercial development as well. Uh, so uh, the, the language today has probably been a little bit focused on housing, but that's where probably the more pressing um, problem is at the moment. Yes, the housing estates. It's not just housing estates. It's light industrial. It's, it's everything. Infill be and greenfield, yeah. Okay, infill and refill, he said. Yes, very briefly, if you would. Uh, John Buchanan, my name, member of the community. Anybody who reads the Sydney Morning Herald and knows about the 
Calabrian Social Club and the huge uh, profit available in rezoning when the minister signs up. Uh, betterment levies are indeed a very good way of collecting large amounts of money. The uh, valuer general is the principal person involved and it's uh, something that has a lot of uh, possibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you for your brevity. We'll come here, there, and then we will need to vote. Thank you. Just very quickly following on the conversation from Jane um, Irwin, um, could we please get the green infrastructure brought into the equation and mentioned in these documents, um, not just in a throwaway line, but actually get that in there and absorbed into the strategic planning? Thank you. Thanks. It's great. And just we'll go to the middle. No, we won't. We'll, we'll go to, to looking at those, if we can, of those, those five questions. If you'd vote now... In consideration of who pays for infrastructure, which of the five options do you support? I'll ask you to vote now so that we can bring up the empty screens for other options to be included. All right, just a few more seconds there because we have one final uh, question. So how are we going, Paul? What do you think? He's giving me the thumbs up. Not a lot of support for the current system. Local regional levies, plan-based levies have some support and less support for growth bonds and levies on the cost of construction. So just have a look at the screen there. We might leave that uh, screen up for people to just have a look at it. And then, um, then Scott, there's one final question. And this last question for the day is about the administration of levies and who um, manages the administration of levies. So just very briefly run us through what are the options for who manages them? Thanks, Ellen. Uh, this question is hopefully a, a lot simpler than the last question. Uh, so we've come up with six possible options for who would manage the levies. Uh, option one is local councils, uh, and the, they're already a, a levy manager under the current system. Option two would be to utilise the Department of Planning and Infrastructure. Option three would be a mix of those two, in that uh, we'd keep the two buckets of funds uh, available in both local councils and the department managing the locally raised section 94 type funds for local councils and the special infrastructure contribution for the state level funding and infrastructure. A fourth option, a little different, uh, there's been a new entity created called Urban Growth New South Wales. Uh, it's a recently formed body from a merger of Landcom and the Sydney Metropolitan Development Authority. Uh, so a, a new entity uh, that specialises mainly in uh, residential housing. A fifth option would be to transfer the funds to some sort of sub-regional board. Uh, it could, I guess, have representatives from, from councils involved. But I think the, the notion in option five is that you'd gather a, a larger pool of funds. And by being a, a sub-regional board, it would be able to... Um, prioritise across local government areas. And finally, sixth, uh, some sort of new ind independent body. We're, we're open-minded on that. Uh, I guess in option four, urban growth, New South Wales isn't currently involved in developments on a statewide basis or in every local government area. So this new independent body, I guess, might add to the, the transparency of how funds are used and it might uh, create some new expertise that could better allocate the funds. And, ag and again, right at the end of this session, we'll open the screens up and you can indicate whether you... Um, uh, some comments that you may wish to make on who pays for infrastructure and who manages levies. So just having a look at this one, one through six. Can you just describe yes. Number three and number five. Okay, I, I would interpret this as um, under option five. The, I think the state government would reallocate any levies it raises at a state level into this sub-regional board to help allocate. 
Uh, yeah. Who are these people? <laughs> Um, I think we covered a question like this in the last session. It's likely to be a, a mix of local government representatives and, and industry experts, but I guess we'd be open-minded on the, the composition of the board. Yes, the Minister. Um, sorry, could I just say, it, none of this is locked, as I tried to explain earlier, none of it, and so it's difficult because we're trying to, in effect, get uh, 450 people's input to an entire new planning system in less than three and a half hours. So it's challenging. But can I say that my concept, anyway, the, th the thing that's in my head around the sub-regional uh, panels or boards is uh, a concept of bringing in Vancouver, um, what they, it's, it's a little different from here, but what they do is they have the councils represented on a, uh, a sub-regional board, so it sits above the council but below the province, so below the state, and each of the councils have a say in terms of the overall infrastructure that's going to affect their region. And if a council locks in, um, and it, they tell me it's not, uh, it's mostly, um, there is statutory power to it, but it's mostly moral in the sense that if one council and a group of, say, 10 councils determines that it's going to change something in its particular council area that will impact on the rest of the sub region, then everybody gets a vote. And there are different votes. Basically, they were telling me that uh, there's one vote that for, the, for the easy ones, if you like. There's, um, there's a, about 100,000, for each 100,000 people in the, council, in the county, they get one vote. Um, but for some things, they call them weighted votes. They also have an indigenous community who uh, have a voting, but they're not, not a village, not, a, not a, count, a county, but they have a vote and they get a weighted vote on certain issues. So it's essentially around the concept I have in my head at the moment, but it's not necessarily where we're going to be. That's, we're still on this massive curve, learning curve, is the councils having votes dependent upon their size and, and a, a structure around how many people actually make up their area. And if they want to change anything after that, they all have to agree they're going to change it if, it's, if it affects their sub-region. If it's just a local issue, of course, it'd stay as part of the local council. But if it impacts on everybody else, well, democracy would rule. All right, and again, we will open the screen at the end of that, uh, at the end of this question to let you comment on this question number two or question number one, but uh, we are out of time, so if I could take you uh, to the voting now. <laughs> 